I'm really enjoying the conference. I don't travel very much because um, I don't think as scientists, or actually as anybody, we should be contributing too much to carbon emissions from flying. So actually, since about 2006, I seriously have turned down conferences. This one is amazing, and I really appreciate being here. The quality is fantastic. Um, I've interacted with JGI since about 2000. And what I can say unequivocally is that uh, both Tanya Wojcicki and Susanna Tringe should be cloned. <laughs> I don't know how they do what they do. Um, I understand that JGI has sequenced their genomes <laughs> and they cannot find a way to improve them. <laughs> so we're moving straight on to cloning and that's great. All right. So um, this slide here shows uh, um, Elise and Sarah. I took the photo in October 2013, and they're presently on the icebreaker coming back after about a year and a half in Antarctica. So they're also quite inspiring people. So I'm going to overview mainly about the omics that we study. I'll concentrate on one particular study, but it really is an overview. Um, in terms of content, I'd like to give some introduction about environmental microbes and the cold in Antarctica. Um, some of the work that we've done on model microorganisms, and I'm going to focus, tell you about how we've collaborated with JGI. I'll that, then talk about the omics in terms of the environmental omics, particularly to do with the lake work. Um, at the end, I'll focus on uh, just a few minutes telling you about our new CSP program, and that is orientated at the seasonal variation. Let's see if I can get this pointer going. Yep, so the seasonal variation. Okay, so let's start with environmental microbes. So first of all, they literally make the world go round. And I mean literally, so not physically, but in terms of nutrient cycles. And if we were to damage, like everybody knows this, but if we were to perturb particularly badly a critical group, basically life on Earth really would cease to exist. So they're socially responsible guys, and they're great to study. So just a bit of a plug for our school at UNSW. We have a large group that works on environmental microbes. And in fact, there's a new position for a professor in bioinformatics. So if you're interested, maybe give me a contact. So I study environments in, uh, that are cold. And the reason is that, well, they actually dominate the biosphere. So that's alpine regions, glaciers, permafrost. The deep ocean is a very big component as is the polar regions. And most of, about 85% of the Earth actually lives below five degrees. So the animals that live there are really beautiful, but the salient fact is that like the rest of the biosphere, it's dominated by microbes. So we really need to learn, despite they don't look fantastic, but we need to learn who's there, what functions they perform, and of course, how they're gonna be affected by ecosystem changes. So some facts on Antarctica, you might know that it actually it holds a big reserve of the world's fresh water, frozen. So we certainly don't want that melting. In fact, Antarctica is arguably the most important continent for affecting Earth's climate and the global ocean ecosystem function. And the reason is, it's a cold reserve, and so this buffers against the effects of climate change. And this drives, the catabatic winds drive off Antarctica, they cool the water, it becomes dense, and it sinks. The sea ice forms, this is salt is excluded. That also drives, of course, the circulation. And that thermohaline circulation goes right around the planet. It's deep water formation at the poles, and it um, keeps uh, the currents going right around the planet. And of course, we know that they're going to change with climate change. So the ocean, sorry, the Southern Ocean also has a disproportionately large component of CO2 uptake. So it's about 30% despite being about 10% in size. And a big part of this relates to sea ice formation. So sea ice grows up to 20 million square kilometers in a season. It then all melts again. It's actually the biggest physical seasonal change on the planet. And in the sea ice, you can see the brown coloration here. So these are the phytoplankton, and they fix CO2 using sunlight. They're the beginning of the food chain, and they feed everything that's in the ocean. So if we melt their houses, the sea ice, and obviously they can't do their job, and so the ocean then starts to starve. 
Okay, let me jump a little bit then um, to archaea, because I've studied them for about 20 years, uh, particularly those from the cold environment. And this tree that I uh, drew for this review in 2006, it shows the distribution of archaea on the phylogenetic tree. All the blue branches are examples of those from cold environments, and you can see that it's very well covered. The stars represent the cultivated organisms, so there aren't many model organisms to study. And so I started to study this guy, um, a methanogen, which came from an Antarctic lake. It's a meromictic or a stratified lake, and I'll talk more about Ace Lake a little bit later on. It's methane saturated in the bottom waters. So our first paper with JGI was in 2003. You can see the JGI authors here underlined. And um, the amazing thing about methanogens is that our guy grows at minus two, but they, as a group, will grow all the way up to 122 degrees. So methanogens are thermally the most diverse group of organisms that we know about. So for studying adaptation at the genome level, they're a really great representative group. 2009, we published the CLOSE genome, and this we took a long time with a lot of people manually annotating it so that we have it as a great reference source. Uh, we also work on oligotrophic marine bacteria, and so I've just included this slide as well because it was also work that we did with, uh, with the JGI. And where we're presently going, and that's what I'm going to concentrate more on now, um, again, these are two papers with the JGI and they relate to the environmental genomics, and um, I'll spend probably about 10 minutes talking about this lake system. So just to back up then, um, the Antarctic expeditions as Tanya said, I've been down a few times. I've led three expeditions. Um, the present one, as I said, has been running for about a year and a half. We've also had dedicated marine voyages to do Southern Ocean work. So the sampling regime that we use, this is uh, the design from the Global Ocean Survey. There's a pre-filter of 20 micron. We then capture biomass on three micron. Sequentially, it goes through onto 0.8, 0.1, and then we can take the filtrate and concentrate that down using TFF filtration. So some Southern Ocean, I'll show you uh, about four or five different studies, just one slide each, just to give you an idea. So this particular study, we did a transect from Australia all the way through to Antarctica. And what the study showed was a very important role of the polar front. So this is where the Antarctic circumpolar current goes around. And either side of the polar front, the taxonomic and functional processes of the organisms dramatically changes. So it shows the important role that that polar front plays. In this study, we expanded out and used our Antarctic metagenomes to add to all the Global Ocean Survey data to look at the biogeography of SAR-11. And just one of the things that we found from this study was that the uh, phylotype distribution changes with regards to both latitude and temperature. So we could only really perform this work because we had the Antarctic metagenomes. Um, this study here, you may have seen some of the posters actually on the important role that flavor bacteria play in degrading algal matter. So we performed some uh, metagenomes on coastal communities and then picked the one that was most enriched in flavor bacteria, then performed metaproteomics on that so we could look at the functional processes involved in the degradation of that material and then the flow on of the soluble materials to groups like SAR-11. And in this last study, I think this is um, an interesting one because it was the first time that uh, we were able to show that advection, so ocean currents, actually have an effect on microbial community composition. And that's independent of both distance and environment effects. So the study, the reason that we could do it, this had been inferred for some time, that we were able to sample all the different water bodies in the Southern Ocean, and it included samples down to about six kilometers. So we were able to actually test the effect, uh, and it also involved the use of a, an, a, an ocean model. Okay, so that's the Southern Ocean work. As I said, I'm trying to give an overview, and then I'll concentrate on one particular lake. This is actually what it looks like if you arrive in summer at Davis Station. So if it's a nice, beautiful day, you're arriving on the icebreaker, and uh, the region that we study is called the Vestfold Hills. It's about 400 square kilometers. The brown coloration here is an area of exposed rock. Now this used to be under the ocean about five, three to five, seven thousand years ago. So all the communities that we find 
in the, um, the lakes are marine derived. So this is the exposed rock. These are fjords that cut back to the ice mass that goes around it. And there are hundreds of derived, marine derived systems here. So they're like time capsules and the water in the lakes varies from pure fresh water all the way through to hypersaline. So they're wonderful opportunities for studying the evolution of those communities in a very defined time period. So we study Ace Lake, Organic Lake, and Deep Lake. So when they do melt out, this is what they look like, Ace Lake, and you can see the sea ice here in the background where it's melted, but most of the time it's like this, there's a frozen surface on them, and that enables us to then set up work shelters, and from the work shelters we go down through the floor directly into the lake, we pull the water up and it goes directly onto the filters. Okay, this one slide, I'll just give you a little bit of data before I move on to Deep Lake. Um, it summarises four papers um, on Ace Lake and Organic Lake. And I'm just trying to give you a feel for what sort of things do we learn. Um, what we've found is that the systems appear to really rely on key components of the ecosystem. And virus host interactions are particularly important. So here's just one piece of data. So this is from this paper on a virophage. So a virophage is a viral predator of another virus, in this case a phycodenovirus, and then that predates on the algal host. And what our modelling showed was that when you just have the virus and the host, you get a certain bloom cycle. But when you introduce the virophage, you in increase the frequency of blooms, and you also increase the minimum number of algal hosts that you have. And so therefore you increase productivity in the lake, you increase carbon flux. We think that might be then why it's been selected in this system. In Ace Lake, which is a meromictic system, so we look down through the water column here, and you can see the blue line are cells, and the numbers are at this level, and all of a sudden they take this big peak, and they drop back down again. This peak is at the oxycline, and there's green sulfur bacteria present at this layer. It's almost a clonal population. Now look at the red bar, or the red line I should say, these are the virus-like particles. Now instead of being tenfold higher, where the GSB is, at least at the time of sampling, there were almost none there. So this looks like the GSB is resistant to the viruses, and it's therefore a very specialised, very fit member of the community. It contributes critically to the ecosystem in the lake. It also means it's fragile. So it's susceptible to ecosystem change, such as if, if a phage was introduced that predated on it, it will likely wipe out the entire community in the lake. At least that's what we predict. So these are really unanticipated findings and it really highlights, or highlighted to us, just what the omics is worth because I defy anybody to have predicted that we would have seen these sorts of things there. Okay, so let me tell you about this amazing system, Deep Lake. Um, I'm not sure if you can see from the photograph, but uh, it looks like it's recessed, and it is. It's about 50 metres below sea level. It's actually the lowest point on Antarctica you can access. And it's at this level because the water has concentrated down. It's hypersaline, and even in the middle of winter, so the water gets to minus 20, and the air is minus 40, and the water doesn't freeze. So the take-home message, and I'll, I'll back up on this, but the take-home message is that there's this rampant promiscuity going on in the lake. Now, I don't know if that's how they keep warm, but um, that's certainly what we found. And it's intergenera. So to do this work, uh, we set up in 2008 around the lake. We've got our work shelters here. We went, went out on a boat. We had over a kilometre's worth of rope. We pumped water up into drums. We took it back to the side of the lake and then we processed it. So just to remind you, we used this sequential filtration method. We took samples down through the lake. We got four filter depths, three filter sizes. Now the JGI performed the amplicon sequencing, the shotgun metagenomics, and importantly, closed genomes of these organisms. And I really think that the value of the closed genomes should be apparent from this study. So we had four isolates. So these are organisms that we can grow in the laboratory. Now if we look at the phylogenetic tree, this is a very low complexity community and it's got a hierarchical structure. If I put some numbers on here, just the top three members represent 72% of the lake community. 
So just this one here is uh, over 40%. We have the closed genomes of those isolates. They're uh, distinct genera. So if you just look across the tree, you can see they're widely distributed. So coming back to this diagram then, we see these high identity regions that are being exchanged between the distinct genera. They're essentially 100%. They're at least 5 KB. Like if I just focus in, you can see the extent of what's going on here. So there are over 30 regions, up to 35 kilobases. So in the diagram here, it shows you A and I plots using all the halo archaeal genomes, or if you focus in on the high identity regions, the, the bottom line is that with the present data that's available, the Deep Lake community is the only one of the halo archaea that has this extent of exchange going on at this level into genera. By looking for those HIR regions in available metagenome data, it's also not present. So it appears to be somewhat particular to this community in Antarctica. Okay, so what does this mean? So if we have got the exchange going on, it means that the community can potentially homogenize. Now acting against that, of course, is if there are ecotype distinctions, because then we can get selection for those ecotypes. So what I mean is if you imagine these are the three dominant organisms in the lake and they divide, and they start to exchange DNA. If the purple one is most fit and it starts to get selected for, then ultimately you'll get a converging population that's essentially basically the purple genome. Now on the other hand, if you start with the same guys and they divide and they've got their own lifestyles, then it means that they can coexist because they will colonize different components so the, the composition in terms of numbers might be different, but they will coexist and that they'll have some exchange occurring, but not much. So we've seen things that speak to homogenization. Um, what I now want to talk about are the signatures that we see for strain variation. So we can get an insight into this by performing just de novo assembly and looking at a GC versus read depth plot. <coughs> And you can see the three main organisms here clustering, but there's another one. And this one here is related in terms of gene sequence to the most dominant organism. You can see it blowing up here, the, the distinct clusters. We can take that data that's binned and map it, in fact, against the genome sequence of the isolate. Um, there's quite an extent of data, and you can see it mapped out here. And so really what this is, is it's a phylotype that's really different to the isolate. So definitely an indicator of, of genomic variation. Now the other thing that we can do with the great extent of uh, the uh, metagenome data is fragment recruitment. And this really highlights variation. So this is taking the genome sequence of the isolate and recruiting the metagenome data reads to it. So there are big gaps that occurs in all the genomes. And when you look at those regions, yes, you see indicators of mobile elements. But you also see genes such that relate to temperature adaptation or resource utilization. So these phylotypes, I think we can describe as being ecotypes. We can associate functions to the genomic variation. So that's variation at the strain level. The thing I haven't talked about is what about the distinctions just between the main genera? So in the next slide here, this summarizes it. And I'll just walk you through some of the details because there are some really interesting distinctions. So here is the most dominant organism. Here is the second, the third, and one that's a long way away. So for TADL, the first thing is that it's the only one that has the, um, the capacity to produce gas vesicles. And so this allows a halo arc here to move vertically up and down through the water column. So in summertime, when it gets to the surface, it can use light energy, and there are um, uh, it has a good capacity to use light to generate energy. It, can also, it also has the largest number of glycerol kinases. Now, glycerol comes from the algae that grows in the lake, such as Dunaliella. It has more kinases than any of the other organisms. It can also utilize a big variety of sugars. It can use a lot of phosphonate. It can regulate with nitrogen, and it's the only one that can produce storage compounds. So this should help it to get through the times when it's a bit replete. Now, DL31, which is the second most abundant, instead of using sugars, it's orientated at utilizing proteins. So it's proteolytic, 
It's also, interestingly, uh, non-motile. It's the only one of the three that we have that isn't. And I'll come back to this in a minute because it's got um, some other features related to it, I think. The third one is a bit of a generalist. So it can utilise sugars, it can utilise amino acids, it can regulate with nitrogen, but basically it's not specialised. It doesn't really stand out as something that's unique. It's actually the easiest organism to grow, so it's a bit like a weed, I guess, in the lake. I'd also mention, actually, it's got no urease genes, but it can utilise urea. And um, we've recently developed genetics for this organism, and we've made a gene deletion in the process of making a second one. So now, for the first time, we can start to do genetics on these things as well. Uh, lastly, DL1, it can utilise um, amino acids, but this is pretty much free amino acids instead of say, proteinaceous materials. So I think DL31 can attach to particles and utilise that. And DL1 doesn't, can't use glycerol, and I think that this is probably one reason why it doesn't compete very effectively. So, in total, I think there are some pretty clear ecotype distinctions. We can see at the strain level, we can see at the general level. So we have forces that are driving homogenisation, at least potentially. And we also have forces that maintain ecotype um, distinctions and hence sympatric speciation. Okay, so um, what I've shown so far is metagenome-based data. What I'd like to tell you a little bit about is our more recent work on metaproteomics. Um, when we take our samples, we take exactly matching filter sets. So we can then utilise that for metatranscriptomics, metaproteomics, or whatever we want to do. So they're exactly matching. We have over a thousand proteins from the community. Um, for example, the dominant organism, about 55% come from it, which is similar to its proportion in the lake. The really interesting thing, I think, that I'll tell you about is that we get hits to proteins that are variants. So when you look at those proteins, you find in terms of fragment recruitment, low fragment recruitment. So it's indicative of genomic variation in these local regions. Now those that have particularly high levels of variation are the cell surface proteins. So if we have cell surface proteins with variation, then I think that that's an indicator of an evasion mechanism potentially for viruses. And the metaproteome, we also picked up hits to viruses by matching to the metagenome contigs. We also then started to look at the CRISPRs and the CAS. Um, you don't need to see the details of this. The yellow bars are CAS proteins from CRISPRs that we picked up in the metaproteome. And then we mapped these out. This is also work that we did in association with Davi and Nikos here at JGI. And by matching the spaces to the contigs, we could identify the viral uh, sequences or the plasmids, etc., that were the targets. So this slide here essentially tries to put it all together. And let me work you through a, th a few things. So first of all, we see S-layer variation to a very high degree, which is an evasion mechanism, we think. Also the archella, so the archaeal flagella, we see variation. And as you know, viruses like to attach to appendages. Now interestingly, as I mentioned, DL31 doesn't have archella. And I think that this may be somewhat of a trade-off, that its fitness, its ability to survive, is also the fact that it doesn't get invaded by those viruses. It's speculation, but that's what the data seems to suggest. We also see signatures of active viruses, such as prohead scaffold proteins and proteases. We see viruses that infect, or that have the signatures intergenera. So now we have possible vehicles for gene exchange between the genera from these viruses. We also see viruses carrying cellular genes. So I think that we have the vehicles here for also potentially developing genetic variation through the virus. And as of learning about them here uh, a few days ago or yesterday, we also, now that I <coughs> asked the folk back in Sydney, um, two of them have BRAX systems. Is that how you say it? BRAX? BRAX? Um, and we picked up one metaproteome hit too, to one of the BRAX proteins. So overall, there's a complex dynamic, I think, of optimizing host virus interactions. And one way that we will continue with this work, as well as um, uh, doing the metagenome work, Susan Erdman joined my group from Roger Garrett's group in the UK, uh, sorry, in Copenhagen. <coughs> 
Um, and she's been isolating viruses from the filtrate. So these are viruses, EM images of viruses from the isolates. So just a couple of pictures to show you. So it means that now we've got some laboratory models, and at least one of them we have genetics, so we can delve into this a lot further. Okay, so to close off, as I said, I wanted to reflect on our new CSP program. Um, we're going to continue to work on these lake systems, Ace Lake, Organic, and Deep Lake. And this is just a timeline to show you that we have samples from summer, 2006, 2008, and now we have them from 13 and 14, so we have a time series, and we have all the samples throughout the season as well. And that's for Ace Lake and Organic Lake and Deep Lake. So just to illustrate that, we go right through summer, through winter, and then back into summer again. So it's the first time for an Antarctic environment that this kind of study has been able to be performed. We're going to have a time series, depths, filter fractions, the filtrate. We're doing metagenomics, pyrotag sequencing, and essentially everything that um, JGI is willing to do. Closed genomes? Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'll also... <laughs> Also mention that um, we have taken some small scale samples from 85 different lakes that have never ever been studied. Um, these are using Sterovex filters. Uh, they represent a salinity gradient from fresh through to hypersaline. Uh, some of the samples, for example, this one here comes from a turbidity peak in a fjord. And I hypothesize that this turbidity peak will be the, the green sulfur bacterium. And I really want to look at this because it will allow us to assess endemicity of this GSB that we see in Ace Lake. So to finish with some pics to show you what it looks like, these are the kinds of lake systems. So some of them are large and clear. Some of them are pretty small and frozen, you know, particularly in winter when these guys are out there taking the samples. Some of them have algal blooms. These are in summer. Benthic communities, and you can see um, uh, the, the, the turbidity of the water. Some of them you can see the pigmented organisms and also uh, the white salt that's crystallizing out. So these systems tend to get fairly large changes of input. So they get melt water during summer and then they get evaporation that matches against that. And so they're very dynamic systems. Some of them are really quite briny and salty. These are salt crystals you can see here. And these two I think are quite remarkable because you can see when they were flying in on the helicopter, this is the sea ice in the background, and these lakes, they look white because they obviously look like they're frozen. But they're not frozen, they were completely melted, and they were just full of salt crystals. So these are very, very hypersaline systems that no one has ever done any microbiology on before. Okay, so in broad summary, um, I would stress that I think the things that we've found are pretty inconceivable discoveries. Um, as I said, I defy anybody to have hypothesized some of these things. And to put it in perspective, it's taken a lot of different funding organizations and collaborations to generate these hopefully brilliant ideas in the future. The Australian Research Council is the equivalent of the NSF, and that's where I get my base funding from. But to perform these operations, like the expedition at the moment, cost about 2.5 million. That's just for the, uh, the icebreaker time, the helicopter time, clothes, food, that kind of thing. So it's, um, it's a quite a big, en big enterprise. And I seriously would pay, pay homage to JGI because as a member of the international community, this is something that places like Australia cannot fund. And I know that this is the case in other parts of the world. So the funding that comes from US taxpayers' money, I think will translate into globally important science. And so I acknowledge the role of the JGI. And with that, I will close. And if there's time, take any questions. Thank you. So we have time for just a couple of questions. Phil. Um, so do you have a feel for the main mechanisms of the rampant promis promiscuous uh, lateral gene transfer? Yeah, well, we're, you know, we're trying to get a handle on it. That's obviously why the viruses were something of great interest, because they could be vehicles. Haloarchaea are also known for um, forming heterodiploids and being able to undergo exchange of DNA and recombination. 
Um, this has been shown in the laboratory with species. It's not been shown into genera, but um, work by Thane Papke's group has shown that uh, stretches of DNA up to several hundred megabases can recombine. Whether that also occurs here or not, we're not sure. Transformation is obviously it's something that we hypothesized, especially because the lake is cold, it's salty. It's like a natural E. coli transformation system. But we also know from recent work that the haloarchaea can utilize DNA as a food source. And so if they do take up DNA, it could be then only small stretches. So the role that transformation plays is also unclear. Rick, what do you think uh, are the generation times in, in those cold environments? You know, when we talk about gene exchange, uh, even if it is population genetics, uh, do we talk about time frames of days, uh, minutes, dates, uh, years, decades? Yep, so the time frame, the generation time is low. Uh, what we know is that from laboratory cultures, so if you take these guys and grow them in the lab and try and grow them at low temperature, they grow very, very slowly. The prediction is that the uh, generation time would be about six generations or less in the lake. So it does mean that there's probably parallel exchange of DNA going on in that community. That's at least what it would indicate. The upper waters, uh, the water can get above zero degrees in summer. And that's probably actually where a lot of the turnover is occurring in terms of replication. So now that we have the samples throughout the season, and we can take more samples, uh, we can process more samples from the surface, we might get more of an indication of that kind of dynamic. Okay, let's give Rick another hand for an excellent talk.